Okay. I'm going to present say, what we are doing with Erlang in the domain of intelligent traffic systems, but I'm going to present mostly the, the strategic issues on how to apply Erlang to real hardware in the real world um, and why it's been so, such a challenge uh, of doing this until now. So then, in a generic way, I'm looking at developing what an operating system does to, for computer systems to do have an IT infrastructure offering similar services to the real world. And if you look at the core business of an operating system, it's a resource manager, which is managing the resources in a computer system. It has a low tolerance on overhead because everything you, you're going to um, use as a computer resource to do, take better decisions, you have to earn back by better decisions. So low tolerance for compute overhead, but easy allocation, deallocation uh, elements there. On the other hand, if you look at the real world resources, they're very expensive, but it's not so uh, evident to uh, decide to make the right decisions, because if you have a, a truck huh, which you want to deallocate in Barcelona, and you want to reallocate it in Rotterdam, uh, you have to find a way to transport the truck itself to the other place. So it's a different working point which you have to handle. And doing this, um, I basically had two shocking events in my career. Right? The first time when I learned about model-driven architectures, uh, if you're using Erlang, you don't need it at all <laughs> anyway. But the model that is driven, that's driving the application is a model of the computer environment you will be sitting in. It's nothing to, to do with the model of the application world in which your software is uh, running. Second thing, Internet of Things, uh, there is an architecture there and they're talking about resources and entities and the resources they're talking about are located in the Internet uh, and anything that's outside the internet is an entity. And so in, in a way, because you have so many interesting things to do within the computer network, uh, IT people are kind of racist in the sense that anything inside the computer network is the prince and the princess. Anything outside the computer network is, is third class citizen. So you, you're not looking at it and you're more or less, from my perspective, on developing an internet talking to things instead of an internet of things. So. You can allocate and manage the allocation of bandwidth and then uh, computer cores, but the parking space which you really need is not a resource you're going to allocate. That's an application using the Internet of Things. So basically, having IT people making splendid things to do information processing, you say, why can't the application experts manage from there? Huh? So why is it not working by just offering superb IT solutions and services, and then have application people do their thing in their domain. And the problem is that they still are working like in the pre-intelligence period, where doing something uh, in a more complicated way is simply too expensive and impossible. So people in application domains are focused on the decisions in their application domain and performance in their application domain. And to make infrastructures, this is exactly the wrong approach. Because an operating system in a computer uh, is not telling the applications what to do. It's making it's a resource manager which tries to be as agnostic as possible on what you're going to do with the resources. Um, domain experts basically uh, do the wrong thing. They focus on the decision making, making. And because of that, when they start to build what should be an infrastructure, they are implementing a lot of arbitrary constraints. You cannot make cars and trucks drive on the same way of the road without deciding it's left or right. And in 20 different places you take independently a decision and when you start to integrate things you have conflicts. On one side they uh, drive left, on the other part they drive right and when you integrate there's a problem. And what domain experts don't realize is that they're really entering new eras of development and they don't know, so they think they know what are the best decisions, but basically they're not capable of making the best decisions. Why do they know less than 5% of what will be possible 
in their intelligent domain and intelligent traffic it, because they're only a small part of it. Once things get deployed for real, uh, a lot more people get involved, have their inputs, uh, contribute, uh, bring valuable information. In traffic, as long as it's research and development, the real users don't get involved. So you don't know how they will react, how they, how they will use social media to group and, and react as a group. Um, so they, you can't know what your objectives, what your decision-making mechanisms have to be before you ha already have a full deployment. So you need to be able to, um, to postpone the choices you want to make. The working conditions are unknown. Just to give an idea what the order of magnitude is, if you go from small-scale applications to large-scale applications, after the first Gulf War, we, people had to extinguish all the oil uh, fields which were on fire. And they did the first calculation based on current practice, and they concluded they would need about two to three years to put them out. In reality, it took a couple of months, just because of the different scale at which you could work, solutions which were developed on the fly, uh, like they had a, a Russian tank on which they put two jet engines and they just blew out the, the, the fires, which is something which is not practical if you have one fire somewhere at 5,000 kilometers away uh, in the world. This will happen on all these smart uh, worlds and intelligent systems we're going to build, and this kind of from less than 5% uh, according, to, according to current calculations, based on current insights, to full deployment. So if we go to full Internet of Things, we know less than 5% of what will be possible with it. And domain experts don't suffer from a lack of arrogance and, and thinking they know best. <laughs> so it, it's very hard to convince them that they don't know it yet. And maybe the only argument they will listen to, they will be open to, is that they will be beaten, not by a larger community or by people who bring key technologies from other domains, but they will be, be beaten by themselves, not themselves in the future. So after their five years of experience in doing it for real on a larger scale, they will be the experts which will, which will beat their insights today by at least one order of magnitude and probably more. And we have lots of those domains today which are intelligent factories, intelligent grid, smart healthcare, all those domains actually are probably, uh, very plausibly, is that they are below this 5% of potential known today, which will come on later on. So the issue is how do we make an infrastructure which is application domain knowledgeable and still agnostic regarding all the decision-making choices you have to make. And the thing is that instead of asking what are the performance indicators and what are the key objectives, you start by, like in OO design, uh, identifying what's relevant. So what, what's your problem domain? And you don't rely on expectations, you rely on, on what's certain. And in intelligent traffic, you know there will be roads, you know there will be cars, you know people will be commuting, bringing kids to school, go to work, go to shopping on the way back. And how they make the decisions in there, how you arrange it, that you leave out of sight in, when you're making uh, your intelligent infrastructure. I say you have to look at what exists. To be <coughs> is the question, not to act or to decide or to choose is the, is the question. So it's not optimizing, it's really to reflect what exists. Or at least, uh, if you want to per se implement services which have to rely on expectations, be, be prepared to undo them. And let's start with things which is most familiar to IT uh, experts. Undo, you do by resource allocation. So if you want to be able to implement an infrastructure services, which later on might be out of date, eh, deprecated, uh, it's important that they are submitted to explicit resource allocation. So if you want to replace a service, say deciding whether you can allow something on the power grid and not make it crash, uh, which is too restrictive, because at the time you don't know how to make it less restrictive, um, then you have to explicitly submit it to allocation and deallocation mm -hmm. so that if a better uh, or a more adapted, uh, customized version comes along, you can remove in a controlled way the old version and put a new one in. This is something which 
we are familiar with the application domain specialist, uh, definitely not. <clears throat> now to the core design principles on, on how to design for the um, unexpected, to make it successful, an important criteria there is critical user mass. You make artifacts, you make software components uh, which uh, have a certain complexity, have a certain size, and you can only do this in a viable way, an economic viable way, in a technically viable way if you have sufficient critical user mass. And what we learned is that you have to mirror reality uh, according to a system architecture where you recognize resource types, resource instances, activity types, activity instances, and that what you need to build them into what I call a VIP architecture, which means that every activity has ki a kind of an electronic butler a process that's going to manage its activities and is going to look at the resources to find the right trajectory, the right sequence and combination of services to get the activity executed. It's wrong to make a resource knowledgeable about the kind of activities it needs to execute because then it becomes so specialized that uh, you don't, you're not able to get sufficient users for your resource to support it. And of course, you need to be able to make composites and aggregates which vary in time, which are not static, in order to build uh, larger systems and, and keep critical user mass. <clears throat> if we go to traffic, your resource types are very recognizable. So they are all the elements which uh, support uh, transportation of people and other things. And your activities are typical the commuting, ad hoc trips, uh, multimodal trips, and so on. The types are, say, knowledgeable about the how. Huh? So a uh, road segment type knows the physical properties of a road segment, the, the weight of the trucks are allowed to put on it. Uh, if there is a bridge across, uh, what's the maximum height? All those kind of things. They, are not, uh, they don't have any knowledge about specific instances. And the same with, with uh, say, activity types. Uh, they're the specialists on, on knowing how, to, how it, such an uh, activity can be executed, but there's no link to an activity that's physically happening in the real world. To maximize against critical user mass, you have separate software entities which have a reference to their type and ask, uh, the entities are real managers. I mean, they, they don't know anything except manage. <laughs> And one, as soon as you need to take a decision that takes some specific knowledge, they ask their type, eh? they, they ask their technician, their specialist on, on what to do. The reason to do that is that you can implement a very limited amount of managers which can manage a lot of different types uh, in different activities. So these types have a real world counterpart which really exists or has existed or will exist. Um, they have a state, they have a, a history, and importantly, to really get rid of traffic jams, as you will see, they, the resources need an agenda and your activities need intentions. Um, the butlers manage intentions so that you don't have to uh, stay on your smartphone all the time in order to avoid traffic jams. There's a computer process that will know how you commute and you only have to tell it when you do something special. Uh, the same with the, the resources, they have a process which is managing for on behalf of them. <clears throat> now, why is mirroring reality such a good idea to design for the unexpected? That's because it's the only known artifact in the world huh, that's very complex, very big, and fully coherent and consistent. It's not necessarily in the state you want it. Eh? So if you have two cars which have conflicting trajectories, huh, the consistent state which ends up is not so nice, eh, with people injured, killed, and cars uh, becoming worthless, but the real world, if you say time is now, it's one state, it's fully coherent, it's fully consistent. The oldest, say, IT artifact which we know complying with mirroring this are maps. And if you have two maps which disagree on something, one says there is a bridge, the other one says there is no bridge, the third one says there is a tunnel, you just go and have a look at reality. So if you, as long as your IT infrastructure is mirroring the real world, you have very nice properties to make it big and still consistent, coherent, working well. 
If a map is lacking some information, adding information to it is, comp is much easier than if you have something that's a functionality and something's missing, you know, like you have an ERP system and it's assuming that the world, that you make products by assembly, huh? and then somebody is taking cows huh? and, and turning them into steaks, huh? <laughs> and he wants to use an ERP system, SAP or whatever, to manage his business, he will discover that it's like trying to, to talk uh, to a uh, deaf person about music. Eh? I mean, the ERP system is not able to track what's, what's happening there and you have lots of misery. Very important to get it working well is that you have to have a single source of truth mirror. Eh? So you cannot have the same road segment reflected in 20 different places which have different ideas, especially if you go to uh, the instances to the which, has state, which have reflect the state of what's there in reality. <clears throat> what do we do with this? We basically um, have two, say, services which come out of the research. And one is, is not very, say, revolutionary. It's just better forecast. So because we reflect intentions of our users in traffic, you have more information than what's currently being developed and being installed, where people basically uh, track the current state as good as possible, use historical data, and based, based on that, they, they predict where there will be congestion and how long you will be congested and so on. Um, this kind of things is nice, what I call for business class, because if too many people see that information, they react to it, and instead of having uh, the predicted traffic jam, uh, you get the reverse. Eh? I once got uh, a well-announced train strike in Belgium, uh, and so it was announced days on beforehand. It also was spring and very nice weather. Hmm? And I had to be somewhere at the other, other end of Brussels, eh? which is about the champion of traffic jams of, in the world, um, at half past nine. Hmm? So I basically, but I didn't really have to be there at half past nine. I had to present somewhere half past 11. So I said, oh, what the heck? Eh? I just leave at half past eight. And if there's a traffic jam, I just arrive late. Eh? Because of this strike, everybody expected say, double the normal amount of traffic jams. Well, actually, if the speed uh, traps had been installed already, now there are speed traps, then they were not. Had speed traps been installed there at that time, they would have caught me. <laughs> because there was almost nobody on, 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 the, on the highway. There had been a normal traffic jam one hour earlier than <laughs> normal. And then so many people decided this was a perfect occasion to work in their garden. Uh, there was nobody on the thing. So the problem with forecasting in this kind of systems and feeding it into the users is, of course, that the providing them feed-forward information can just invalidate the, the feed-forward information. In our system, the user intentions are propagated on this mirror of reality. And that this is, if you change your intentions, you propagate the change. So if you get a uh, forecast of traffic jam and, and people change their intention, then they will see the shift and they will be able to adapt the forecast. So you, you get better forecasts, but it's still, uh, say, very much a better version of what you will get anyway. <clears throat> I'm talking about propagating intentions, and I've been telling you that I want to keep the decision making out of my infrastructure. Now, intentions are the result of decision making. So how can we design for the unexpected and still in, say, provide something within this infrastructure that's, say, the result of, of decisions? And it's actually a relatively simple step. But it's, it, in the real world, there always is something that takes decisions. Eh? Maybe it's just physics. Eh? If you have a ball and you drop it, eh, it's gravity and the laws of nature that take the decisions. But there is always something that takes the decisions. If you get to the point now, eh, all decisions have been taken from a practical point of view. So you can mirror the decision making just like you mirror the, of the, the existence of roads and crossings and whatever and commuting activities in the real world. So you, instead of uh, having expectations of what the decision mechanisms will be, you make it model driven by models of whatever the decision-making mechanisms are. 
Now, if you got automated systems and your code is not too complicated, that's very easy to have those models because the code can be its own model. It's only when you have humans making the decisions or natural processes or compute heavy code that you will have to do the effort of making approximations, maybe use some machine learning and, and use that to propagate the, say, compute, predict the intentions and propagate the intentions across your mirror image of the real world. Um, because if you want to generate predictions and refresh them quite regularly, of course, it's necessary that your mirror image can execute virtually what's going to happen much faster than reality. So the, the slower your real world is and the more important it is, the more you can apply this design for the unexpected. Okay. Because you want to say propagate intentions and see what's going to happen in the real world, it's key to have this single source of truth design. There's no point in having 20 versions mirroring your uh, road segment and have people propagate their intentions, but not all on the same road segment. Because the, the thing is going to predict congestion simply because there is one reflection of the road segment. It sees all the intentions coming by virtual execution for tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Its self-model is able to deduce the level of congestion you get, and it will be able to predict uh, congestion, yes or no. If you have, don't have a single source of truth design, then you get into uh, problems because this is what's happening with the car navigation systems. Eh? They all have their own private model of the real world where you need one. They need to talk to a single one at the traffic center uh, so that you can see what's happening with all the other, how you're going to have interference from all the other users in order to get a useful uh, prediction. <coughs> so what do we do? We build a mirror image of our traffic system and we're able to do virtual execution using models of the decision mechanisms, whatever the decision mechanisms are. And keep in mind, we're always in a re ev evaporate refresh mode, which means that uh, this is not something that plans, gives you the result and stops. No, this is something which keeps on working and your intentions are regularly resent through the system uh, so that if something has changed, you will see it and you will see the consequences and you can react to it. So it's a, you're going to use this virtual execution. So you have your intention, you generate, you do execute your trips virtually because everyone is doing it on a single source of truth model. Uh, every part of the road infrastructure can predict its future state. And instead of having an assumption that highway will be 100 kilometers per hour, every section of the highway knows exactly what its expected loading will be and can predict the expected congestion. And when you do this virtual execution, you get expected travel times which correspond to the congestion levels. If you want to eliminate Traffic jams, it's not enough to just have better predictions. So you, you need to <coughs> have your users follow instructions. If you, there's no way around it. Eh? So you, do, you cannot have <coughs> uh, traffic jam free road infrastructure or travel system uh, without people following instructions. So at some point people think uh, we, we need a big brother. Eh? Somebody who is taking all the information is going to make <coughs> all the decisions for us. Um, and you already see that you would be living in a boarding school where Mother Superior uh, takes the one-size-fits-all decisions. The advantage of having users following instructions is that a lot of mod modeling challenges which remain and which are intrinsically very difficult um, will be resolved by users following instructions. Uh, it's not so difficult to uh, model, say, how road segments behave, but if you look at crossings, you can get butterfly effects. And so the right of way to the right of a crossing, just arriving a little bit earlier or later can make a difference on, on who gets first into a road segment. If at the next crossing, the one who gets first has to turn left and there's lots of traffic coming from the other side, say a small change can have a big effect on, on what's happening there. If you get into a more managed system, you can 
you can see those things coming and you can have small local improvement algorithms to avoid the negative effects and get the positive effects and anyway get uh, more predictable uh, traffic. <coughs> the way we do the, the virtual execution, I'm not going to deta in detail on, on this talk, is actually a combination of uh, more classic traffic modeling from the traffic experts and intention propagation which comes from intelligent manufacturing control systems. So the classical traffic models, flow models, are very good at modeling the back propagation. So what you have is, at a certain point, there is shortage of capacity, so you get traffic jams and people queue up, and such a queue will propagate downwards eh, against the flow of traffic with a certain speed, about a bit less than 20 kilometers per hour. So you do modeling these kind of things, traffic people are very good at and very efficient. Uh, in our approach, this would be uh, requiring a lot of iterations to get the same result, uh, which they get in one iteration. What they're not good at, because they don't know how, they don't take in the right information, is the forward propagation, how the, the traffic density will propagate forward in the network, and we use our delegate multi-agent system to do that. But coming back to the fact that if we want to get rid of traffic jams, at, s at some point you will have to follow instructions, the good news is that most of the time, it's enough that you follow your own instructions. Because you put in the decision mechanisms, you propagate it, when you see that your idea is not very nice, uh, you're going to um, have the opportunity to change your intentions, you repropagate your intentions, and basically um, <coughs> you're able to um, to adopt, and if there is no real capacity problem, if it's just a matter of, take, say, agreeing amongst each other what, intent, what, what decisions to take, it's enough that you are obeying your own instructions. All that's necessary is a kind of social control, and this can be uh, on a voluntary basis if people have the right culture, or this can be more enforced. If you propagate intentions, and Later on, you decide to change them or deviate them when you really are driving along the road, and other people get problems with that. Of course, that there's no free, you don't go for free, eh? so this will have some repercussions uh, in the way you do. But you're, so you make your intentions known to the rest of the world, and you have a kind of commitment to that. But nobody has to tell you what these intentions will be. You can actually, as a user, freely decide about it, you can, as groups of users, use social media or whatever, use the system itself to coordinate and make nice decisions. So in all those cases, uh, you basically don't uh, need to obey a boss, you obey yourself. Except, of course, when there is a real capacity constraint um, in which, say, policies need to arbitrate or you can, as a group, decide, okay, then there will be a traffic jam. Yeah? That's also a policy. Uh, but when the users are able to work it out amongst themselves, there is no reason in this kind of infrastructure why government or whoever, ever, uh, or traffic specialists, uh, the functionaries who run it, should tell you what to do. You can just, you get the first shot, and uh, so you follow instructions, but you follow your own instructions. That's basically what's happening. <coughs> so how does this work? You have your eButler, is managing your traveling, eh? maybe other activities as well, uh, your commuting, whatever, is going to propagate, is going to look at a mirror image consisting of airline processes, eh? with going door, uh, of what possible executions are for your needs. And the e-butler is the one who knows what are your don't cares and what are your needs and what are your hard constraints. And is going to do this routing on this map, which is basically a uh, collection of connected airline processes which mirror the road infrastructure. These road infrastructure elements give answers which account for the intentions that are already propagated. So if you t decide to commute at rush hour, and a lot of other people dis uh, already want to do that, you're going to see that it's already very heavily con congested. Your e-butler knows that you don't mind getting up early or the, the, your workload permits you to arrive late at office and he's going to look for better solutions. He has a selection mechanism, selects one, these are your intentions, he's going to propagate your intentions 
and these are going to be added to the information in the road infrastructure part, and other users will see, say, what your impact is on, on the expected loads. And this way you get, with constant refresh, you get a continuous image of current state of the traffic, future state of the traffic, and commitments of the users to stick to these things. They, of course, can always be nice to everybody and change their intentions in a way that nobody has problems. Uh, if they change their intentions in a way that somebody has issues with it, there are policies which apply. Um, and only in the places where there's real shortage of capacity, you need community policies to manage that. And there are some, some simple, like, uh, pricing, but also uh, anti-starvation and, and uh, priority based on, on that you do, did this already for three years, eh? things like that. So it not, it's not necessarily that it's only uh, money which can uh, handle this. What are the kind of gains you can get with this kind of systems is that you can optimize the time in which you're sitting in, in the location in which you're sitting in traffic jams. I mean, there are some places where there is shortage of capacity, eh? but it's nicer to sit in the traffic jam in your office or at home than in a car somewhere on the road. So you can organize the system in such a way that the, the slots on the constraint uh, parts of the road are basically um, reserved. And in order to get to your slot, you wait at home or you wait in your office or you wait in a bar uh, in order to do something useful with your time. And then when it's time to leave, you just go and the system will, because everybody <laughs> makes his intentions clear, eh? Even if you stay to the last minute in your office and then you go out and, and the traffic jam, the bottleneck is five kilometers away, your right of way to, to this slot is priority. Eh? If somebody is going to stop you there and not use the, and because of that the capacity of the bottleneck is not used, then of course uh, you need to have a mechanism there to say not make this something that happens a lot of, very frequently. And what you, basically want to abolish is that you never have to say, if I had known, eh, I would have acted differently. Eh? You know up front, it's like the bus is telling you, the, the subway, the, the metro telling you how long it will take for the next one to arrive. Uh, if you go to the airport, it's the display tells you how long it will take before your suitcase is passing on. This kind of, of stress, uh, less living eh, is going to be offered by that. And the second thing which you basically want to implement there is that uh, good deeds are rewarded eh? in the sense that if you um, stay out of the, uh, if you are nice to other people in a don't care way, that you don't get penalized for that. So what you basically have is that uh, because people having to sit in traffic jams do this at home, you avoid that anyone else with nothing to do with the traffic jam is also sitting within uh, the traffic jam. Typical example, uh, I living somewhere in a highway going to Brussels, have to get on the highway, but not to go to Brussels, to go to the other side. And the traffic jam is direction of Brussels. Because I had, don't have a system to have all the people going to Brussels wait at home until they have their slot to Brussels, I will be stuck in a traffic jam and I have nothing, I uh, actually have no connection to the cause of the traffic jam. So a lot of people, I think more people are sitting in traffic jams without being part of the traffic jam than, than the reverse. With this kind of prediction and the ability to have commitments from all users, uh, you're able to only have people who are affected by the, the bottleneck having to, say, take it into account and, and time the time, say, adjust the time at which they leave home eh, and will be sitting in, in the, the congestion part. Um, but all the people who don't have to be there, they will not be stuck eh, behind somebody who is queuing up to go to Brussels. So you get a lot of, say, win-win situations, free lunch situations, simply by building an infrastructure in which you can, um, say, you can have commitments. Because of those commitments, you can be nice to other people, and because of the system, you will not be penalized because you're nice. Eh? So. You reserve your parking space. Because of being nice to other people, you arrive 10 minutes later eh? at home, eh? where you can do something useful with your time. But you're not penalized by the fact that now you don't have a nice parking space and you have to go somewhere where you have to walk a lot of distance or pay uh, 
in a paid parking space. The, the application of, of the no traffic jams version hmm, it requires that almost everybody participates. So that's the, let's say, the difficult thing about the whole solution. So you can predict, you, you can wait at home instead of sitting in traffic jam in the car. Um, you know upfront how long it will take to, to travel, but it only works if almost everybody participates. Huh? And the almost depends how much of your capacity you have to keep a, keep a spare capacity. Huh? The less predictable people are, the less you're able to go to full utilization of, of, of the, the capacity. But um, it doesn't work if only, say, 30% of the travelers participate. So the, the migration path to this kind of solutions is to start with managed parts of the infrastructure. So you, can, you don't start with the whole road, you start with the bus lanes, which we are now the buses are only allowed to travel, and maybe in some places the taxis. And you, uh, people who participate in the system are allowed, uh, when they get permission from the system, to also use the bus lanes. And you can make sure, because of the commitments, that the buses and the taxis will be traveling as fluently as they are now, only you don't lose the, the spare capacity. Because you're able to use bus lanes at full capacity, the decision to have more bus lanes becomes easier. Uh, and it's important, and also the decision to have a bus lane going completely through the bottlenecks becomes easier because you're not losing the capacity today. It's always a trade-off. If you make a bus lane, you're going to lose infrastructure capacity. Um, if you apply this kind of systems, you keep full capacity. Last points I want to uh, tell about what are the, the major obstacles for you to enjoy this kind of comfort. First of all, the traffic specialists which still believe that they know the right objectives, although they have no idea how their customers, the travelers, will react once they deploy things. And they still ignore that it's possible to build an IT infrastructure, a first layer, which is agnostic, which doesn't make the choices, and that they can, with much less effort, try out and change the, the different versions of how you're going to manage uh, your system overall. Um, and they also have, say, selfish preferences in the sense that they like to see the money go to things with, which they like to play with. Huh? So it's a typical thing. The other thing is ignorance and concerning privacy technologies. Um, there are people who just think that privacy is a luxury which only criminals need. Uh, if you're in self-organization, it can guarantee you that uh, Big Brother is the way to get a criminal government in the end. Huh? So if you chase, if nobody can hide for Big Brother, you will catch most of the criminals, but the ones who escape will be Big Brother. So it's, so you need privacy, um, including privacy against the government, huh? not just against other users, because the, the way the system works is like the way hotels work. So for normal users, the design ensures privacy because you don't see who is, say, causing the congestion uh, on the, so you don't see what other users do. You need privacy against insiders, uh, hackers inside Fix Center or the governments which, which want to abuse it. And uh, currently there are two bottlenecks there. First of all, a lot of people don't know about hard privacy, about privacy enhancing technologies using cryptography. That's the one part which is missing. On the other hand, people who are doing research on privacy are not interested in middle of the road solutions. Uh, because Hard privacy tends to be quite expensive computationally at some point, where encryption, especially uh, secret key encryption, is, is cheap. And um, there are solutions where you basically uh, have privacy unless uh, a number of court orders force uh, servers, operators, to uh, unclose, to disclose information. So you, they're not developing systems where you need to have a court order in Geneva and Delaware to know whoever has been at a certain point uh, in traffic. Um, so the technology, the know-how to, to ensure privacy actually in principle is, is very likely to exist, but the people involved either are blocking eh, the privacy, oh, we don't want it, or are too extreme, too fundamentalistic in, in the direction of, of uh, in enforcing privacy there. Okay, so to conclude and open, have some time for question and answer. So I think 
looking at the kind of system I'm proposing, I don't have to argue to an airline audience that this is the natural way to implement it. Because, and it's a, a scalable one, because if you start to assign your processes on, on hard airline nodes, uh, it's very easy to get locality. Huh? So you don't end up, it's very unlikely you end up with nodes which have to talk more to other nodes than they have to do work internally. So it's a very, you need this single source of uh, truth design where you need this, what I call a delicate mass to uh, propagate and distribute non-local <laughs> information. And if you look at what's making classical IT systems like ERP systems fail or cause frustration, it's because they try to capture real-world interaction into data formats, database tables or, or whatever. And that's where it doesn't work. It's like trying to help your grandmother with her computer by use, writing a user guide, and then you can't talk anymore about computers to your grandma. So uh, that's what classical systems are basically trying to do. And I've been say, telling you in a more general sense how you can make infrastructures application knowledgeable without, well, remaining infrastructures and not becoming specific uh, solutions. Uh, and how to do it, including being able to forecast, to anticipate, to be proactive, uh, by having uh, intention propagation and agendas uh, for the resources involved. Okay, so I'm gonna take some. Okay, so we have uh, about two minutes for questions. Are there any for, here you go. Yes, have you used this system on data based on uh, GPS that exists in cars? This is an, an ongoing European project, and what we're doing now is that you have a kind of uh, <coughs> you have a model, which is a micro simulator, which uh, models the a real existing situation, to which you connect this system, and the users in the, in a deployed system would be using smartphones and apps to be connected to it. But we're say in a development phase, so this is the currently. We're developing this in, in Erlang with uh, a Sumo micro simulator connected to it, which is, I think, uh, modeling Nottingham and then probably Leuven uh, to run it on in simulation. This is still, say, quite some distance from real world application, this kind of thing. Yeah. So, so, what is the core uh, identifier of uh, vehicles? Is it the GPS in cars or is it their mobile phones? What is the main uh, focus in your project? Well, it's kind of agnostic to how this happens, eh? but I think that the, the model there is basically that's the car navigation system, or the, if you're not necessarily driving in a car, eh? you can be on a bicycle or a public transport, and it would be your mobile phone, smartphone, and basically. The model is basically that if you get this kind of comfortable travel, uh, the expense of having a smartphone is, is quite justified. So this is the, the basic assumption. Okay, we'll do one more question. Uh, do you know there are already at least two mobile applications which do this? They collect traffic, speed, and mm. uh, GPS mm. location, yeah. and predict where should you go to avoid the traffic. Mm -hmm. And one of them being Waze, which was recently acquired by Google uh, yeah. for, for mm -hmm. a huge amount of uh, American candy wraps. Yeah. And the uh, other one is being uh, made in Russia is Yandex Traffic Gems, yeah. which is basically the same. They collect uh, traffic data from mobiles, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they don't have all picture, but they use some yeah. sta st statistical calculations and guesses yeah. uh, to predict. So yeah. uh, Well, y y you can download Waze right now and go on the street. It, mm -hmm. it will. It's it it uses your GPS to see mm -hmm. how fast are you moving, mm -hmm. yeah. and then it will tell you turn right here, yeah. and you will think no, I don't want to turn here. I'm going forward. Yeah. But then you hit the traffic jam, yeah. and then you, you well, will be sorry. But you're, but you're describing it. Huh? Including, including, yes. including advice. Uh, huh? It's current state mostly, but I think yeah. they use predictions as well. This is not part of it, and commitment to, well, to, to, in, you, to intentions is also not part of it. You specify where are you going, but I, yeah. I'm not sure if it can tell you to go later. Yeah. So what you, what you basically have in this system is that you virtually execute your intention, that you look for solutions yourself on this mirror. Huh? So there's no system that's going to 
advise the router. You have your own. Well, my system will allow you to just explore the possibilities and will tell you, okay, if you, if you do this, huh, then you will hit the jam huh, because we didn't solve it. So it, it's, it's less, say, doing it for you. Huh? So it, how you search is your own choice. Huh? And, and uh, the only thing which, and it, you, you propagate your intention with then, of course, the, if you build it to a full system, um, with, say, commitments to intention. So these are the, the additional things which you have in there. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's have a round of applause, please. <laughs> um, and then next we're going to have uh, Zvi.